Sons and Lovers by D. H. Lawrence Chapter Five Part One Paul Launches into Life Morel was rather a heedless man, careless of danger, so he had endless accidents. Now, when Mrs. Morel heard the rattle of an empty coal cart seized at her entry end, she ran into the parlour to look, expecting almost to see her husband seated in the wagon, his face grey under his dirt, his body limp and sick with some hurt or other. If it were he, she would run out to help. About a year after William went to London, and just after Paul had left school, before he got work, Mrs. Morel was upstairs and her son was painting in the kitchen. He was very clever with his brush. When there came a knock at the door. Crossly, he put down his brush to go. At the same moment his mother opened a window upstairs and looked down. A pit lad in his dirt stood on the threshold. "'Is this Walter Morel's?' he asked. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Morel. "'What is it?' But she had guessed already. "'Your master's got hurt,' he said. "'Eh, hey, dear me!' she exclaimed. "'It's a wonder if he hadn't, lad. And what's he done this time?' "'I don't know for sure, but it's his leg somewhere. They're taking him to the hospital.' "'Good gracious me!' she exclaimed. "'Eh, hey, dear, what a one he is! There's not five minutes of peace I'll be hanged if there is. His thumb's nearly better, and now—' Uh, did you see him? I seed him at the bottom, and I seed him bring him up in a tub, and he were in a dead faint. But he shouted like anything when Dr. Fraser examined him in the lamp cabin, and cost and swore, and said as he were going to be taken home. He weren't going to the hospital. The boy faltered to an end. He would want to come home so that I can have all the bother. Thank you, my lad. Eh, hey, dear, if I'm not sick, sick and surfeited, I am. She came downstairs. Paul had mechanically resumed his painting. And it must be pretty bad if they've taken him to the hospital, she went on. But what a careless creature he is. Other men don't have all these accidents. Yes, he would want to put all the burden on me. Eh, hey, dear, just as we were getting easy a bit at last. Put those things away. There's no time to be painting now. What time is there a train? I know I shall have to go trailing to Keston. I shall have to leave that bedroom. I can finish it, said Paul. You needn't. I shall catch the seven o'clock back, I should think. Oh, my blessed heart, the fuss and commotion he'll make. And those granite sets at Tinder Hill. He might well call them kidney pebbles. They'll jolt him almost to bits. I wonder why they can't mend them, the state they're in, and all the men as go across in that ambulance. You'd think they'd have a hospital here. The men bought the ground, and, my sirs, there'd be accidents enough to keep it going. But no, they must trail them ten miles in a slow ambulance to Nottingham. It's a crying shame. Oh, and the fuss he'll make. I know he will. I wonder who's with him. Barker, I should think. Poor beggar! He'll wish himself anywhere, rather. But he'll look after him, I know. Now there's no telling how long he'll be stuck in that hospital, and won't he hate it! But if it's only his leg, it's not so bad." All the time she was getting ready. Hurriedly taking off her bodice, she crouched at the boiler while the water ran slowly into her lading-can. "'I wish this boiler was at the bottom of the sea!' she exclaimed, wriggling the handle impatiently. She had very handsome, strong arms, rather surprising on a smallish woman. Paul cleared away, put on the kettle, and set the table. "'There isn't a train till four-twenty,' he said. "'You've time enough.' "'Oh, no, I haven't!' she cried, blinking at him over the towel as she wiped her face. "'Yes, you have. You must drink a cup of tea, at any rate.' Should I come with you to Keston? Come with me? What for, I should like to know? Now, what have I to take him? Eh, hey, dear, his clean shirt, and it is a blessing it is clean. But it had better be aired. And stockings, he won't want them. And a towel, I suppose. 
and handkerchiefs. Now what else? A comb, a knife and fork and spoon, said Paul. His father had been in the hospital before. Goodness knows what sort of state his feet were in, continued Mrs. Morel, as she combed her long brown hair, that was fine as silk and was touched now with grey. He's very particular to wash himself to the waist, but below he thinks doesn't matter. But there, I suppose, they see plenty like it." Paul had laid the table. He cut his mother one or two pieces of very thin bread and butter. "'Here you are,' he said, putting her cup of tea in her place. "'I can't be bothered!' she exclaimed crossly. "'Well, you've got to, so there. Now it's put out already,' he insisted. So she sat down and sipped her tea, and ate a little in silence. She was thinking. In a few minutes she was gone, to walk the two and a half miles to Keston Station. All the things she was taking him she had in her bulging string-bag. Paul watched her go up the road between the hedges, a little, quick-stepping figure, and his heart ached for her, that she was thrust forward again into pain and trouble. And she, tripping so quickly in her anxiety, felt at the back of her, her son's heart waiting on her, felt him bearing what part of the burden he could, even supporting her. And when she was at the hospital she thought, "'It will upset that lad when I tell him how bad it is. I'd better be careful.' And when she was trudging home again she felt he was coming to share her burden. "'Is it bad?' asked Paul, as soon as she had entered the house. "'It's bad enough,' she replied. What? She sighed and sat down, undoing her bonnet strings. Her son watched her face as it was lifted, and her small, work hardened hands fingering at the bow under her chin. Well, she answered, it's not really dangerous, but the nurse says it's a dreadful smash. You see, a great piece of rock fell on his leg, here, and it's a compound fracture. There are pieces of bone sticking through. "'Ah! Oh, how horrid!' exclaimed the children. "'And,' she continued, "'of course he says he's going to die. It wouldn't be him if he didn't. I'm done for, my lass,' he said, looking at me. "'Don't be so silly,' I said to him. "'You're not going to die of a broken leg, however badly it's smashed. I shall never come out of here but in a wooden box,' he groaned. "'Well,' I said, "'if you want them to carry you into the garden in a wooden box, when you're better, I've no doubt they will.' "'If we think it's good for him,' said the sister. "'She's an awfully nice sister, but rather strict.' Mrs. Morel took off her bonnet. The children waited in silence. "'Of course, he is bad,' she continued. "'And he will be. It's a great shock, and he's lost a lot of blood.' And, of course, it is a very dangerous smash. It's not at all sure that it will mend so easily. And then there's the fever and the mortification. If it took bad ways, he'd quickly be gone. But there, he's a clean-blooded man, with wonderful healing flesh, and so I see no reason why it should take bad ways. Of course, there's a wound. She was pale now with emotion and anxiety. The three children realized that it was very bad for their father, and the house was silent, anxious. "'But he always gets better,' said Paul, after a while. "'That's what I tell him,' said the mother. Everybody moved about in silence. "'And he really looked nearly done for,' she said. "'But the sister says that is the pain.' Annie took away her mother's coat and bonnet. And he looked at me when I came away. I said, I shall have to go now, Walter, because of the train, and the children. And he looked at me. It seems hard. Paul took up his brush again and went on painting. Arthur went outside for some coal. Annie sat looking dismal. And Mrs. Morel, in her little rocking chair that her husband had made for her when the first baby was coming, remained motionless, brooding. She was grieved, 
and bitterly sorry for the man who was hurt so much. But still, in her heart of hearts, where the love should have burned, there was a blank. Now, when all her woman's pity was roused to its full extent, when she would have slaved herself to death to nurse him and to save him, when she would have taken the pain herself if she could, somewhere far away inside her, she felt indifferent to him and to his suffering. It hurt her most of all, this failure to love him, even when he roused her strong emotions. She brooded a while. "'And there,' she said suddenly, "'when I'd got halfway to Keston, I found I'd come out in my working boots and look at them.' They were an old pair of Paul's, brown and rubbed through at the toes. "'I didn't know what to do with myself for shame,' she added. In the morning, when Annie and Arthur were at school, Mrs. Morrell talked again to her son, who was helping her with her housework. "'I found Barker at the hospital. He did look bad, poor little fellow. Well, I said to him, what sort of a journey did you have with him? Dunna ax me, missus, he said. I, I said, I know what he be. But it war bad for him, Mrs. Morrell, it war that, he said. I know, I said. At every jolt I thought my art would have flown clean out of my mouth, he said. And the scream he gives sometimes— Missus, not for a fortune would I go through with it again. I can quite understand it, I said. It's a nasty job, though, he said, and one as'll be a long while afore it's right again. I'm afraid it will, I said. I like Mr. Barker. I do like him. There's something so manly about him. Paul resumed his task silently. And, of course, Mrs. Morrell continued, for a man like your father, the hospital is hard. He can't understand rules and regulations, and he won't let anybody else touch him, not if he can help it. When he smashed the muscles of his thigh, and it had to be dressed four times a day, would he let anybody but me or his mother do it? He wouldn't. So, of course, he'll suffer in there with the nurses. And I didn't like leaving him. I'm sure, when I kissed him and came away, it seemed a shame." So she talked to her son, almost as if she were thinking aloud to him, and he took it in as best he could, by sharing her trouble to lighten it. And in the end she shared almost everything with him without knowing. Morrell had a very bad time. For a week he was in a critical condition. Then he began to mend. And then, knowing he was going to get better, the whole family sighed with relief, and proceeded to live happily. They were not badly off whilst Morrell was in the hospital. There were fourteen shillings a week from the pit, ten shillings from the sick club, and five shillings from the disability fund, and then every week the buddies had something for Mrs. Morrell, five or six shillings, so that she was quite well to do. And whilst Morrell was progressing favourably in the hospital, the family was extraordinarily happy and peaceful. On Saturdays and Wednesdays Mrs. Morrell went to Nottingham to see her husband. Then she always brought back some little thing, a small tube of paints for Paul, or some thick paper, a couple of postcards for Annie, that the whole family rejoiced over for days before the girl was allowed to send them away or a fret-saw for Arthur, or a bit of pretty wood. She described her adventures into the big shops with joy. Soon the folk in the picture-shop knew her, and knew about Paul. The girl in the book-shop took a keen interest in her. Mrs. Morrell was full of information when she got home from Nottingham. The three sat round till bedtime, listening, putting in, arguing. Then Paul often raked the fire. I'm the man in the house now," he used to say to his mother, with joy. They learned how perfectly peaceful the home could be, and they almost regretted, though none of them would have owned to such callousness, that their father was soon coming back. Paul was now fourteen, and was looking for work. He was a rather small and rather finely made boy, with dark brown hair and light blue eyes. 
His face had already lost its youthful chubbiness, and was becoming somewhat like William's, rough-featured, almost rugged, and it was extraordinarily mobile. Usually he looked as if he saw things, was full of life, and warm. Then his smile, like his mother's, came suddenly and was very lovable. And then, when there was any clog in his soul's quick running, his face went stupid and ugly. He was the sort of boy that becomes a clown and a lout as soon as he is not understood, or feels himself held cheap, and again is adorable at the first touch of warmth. He suffered very much from the first contact with anything. When he was seven, the starting school had been a nightmare and a torture to him. But afterwards he liked it. And now that he felt he had to go out into life, he went through agonies of shrinking self-consciousness. He was quite a clever painter for a boy of his years, and he knew some French and German and mathematics that Mr. Heaton had taught him. But nothing he had was of any commercial value. He was not strong enough for heavy manual work, his mother said. He did not care for making things with his hands, preferred racing about, or making excursions into the country, or reading, or painting. "'What do you want to be?' his mother asked. "'Anything?' "'That is no answer,' said Mrs. Morrell. But it was, quite truthfully, the only answer he could give. His ambition, as far as this world's gear went, was quietly to earn his thirty or thirty-five shillings a week somewhere near home, and then, when his father died, have a cottage with his mother, paint, and go out as he liked, and live happily ever after. That was his programme as far as doing things went. But he was proud within himself, measuring people against himself, and placing them inexorably and he thought that perhaps he might also make a painter the real thing, but that he left alone. "'Then,' said his mother, "'you must look in the paper for the advertisements.' He looked at her. It seemed to him a bitter humiliation and an anguish to go through. But he said nothing. When he got up in the morning his whole being was knotted up over this one thought— I've got to go and look for advertisements for a job. It stood in front of the morning, that thought, killing all joy and even life for him. His heart felt like a tight knot. And then, at ten o'clock, he set off. He was supposed to be a queer, quiet child. Going up the sunny street of the little town, he felt as if all the folk he met said to themselves, He's going to the co-op reading room to look in the papers for a place. He can't get a job. I suppose he's living on his mother. Then he crept up the stone stairs behind the drapery shop at the co-op, and peeped in the reading room. Usually one or two men were there, either old useless fellows or colliers on the club. So he entered, full of shrinking and suffering when they looked up, seated himself at the table, and pretended to scan the news. He knew they would think, "'What does a lad of thirteen want in a reading-room with a newspaper?' And he suffered. Then he looked wistfully out of the window. Already he was a prisoner of industrialism. Large sunflowers stared over the old red wall of the garden opposite, looking in their jolly way down on the women who were hurrying with something for dinner. The valley was full of corn, brightening in the sun. Two collieries, among the fields, waved their small white plumes of steam. Far off on the hills were the woods of Annesley, dark and fascinating. Already his heart went down. He was being taken into bondage. His freedom in the beloved home valley was going now. The brewer's wagons came rolling up from Keston with enormous barrels, four aside, like beans in a burst bean-pod. The wagoner, throned aloft, rolling massively in his seat, was not so much below Paul's eye. The man's hair on his small bullet head was bleached almost white by the sun, and on his thick red arms, rocking idly on his sack apron, the white hairs glistened. His red face shone and was almost asleep with sunshine. The horses— 
handsome and brown, went on by themselves, looking by far the masters of the show. Paul wished he were stupid. I wish, he thought to himself, I was fat like him, and like a dog in the sun. I wish I was a pig in a brewer's wagoner. Then, the room being at last empty, he would hastily copy an advertisement on a scrap of paper, then another, and slip out in immense relief. His mother would scan over his copies. Yes, she said, you may try. William had written out a letter of application, couched in admirable business language, which Paul copied with variations. The boy's handwriting was execrable, so that William, who did all things well, got into a fever of impatience. The elder brother was becoming quite swanky. In London he found that he could associate with men far above his bestwood friends in station. Some of the clerks in the office had studied for the law, and were more or less going through a kind of apprenticeship. William always made friends among men wherever he went, he was so jolly. Therefore he was soon visiting and staying in houses of men who, in Bestwood, would have looked down on the unapproachable bank manager, and would merely have called indifferently on the rector. So he began to fancy himself as a great gun. He was, indeed, rather surprised at the ease with which he became a gentleman. His mother was glad he seemed so pleased, and his lodging in Walthamstow was so dreary but now there seemed to come a kind of fever into the young man's letters. He was unsettled by all the change. He did not stand firm on his own feet, but seemed to spin rather giddily on the quick current of the new life. His mother was anxious for him. She could feel him losing himself. He had danced and gone to the theatre, boated on the river, been out with friends, and she knew he sat up afterwards in his cold bedroom grinding away at Latin, because he intended to get on in his office, and in the law as much as he could. He never sent his mother any money now. It was all taken, the little he had, for his own life. And she did not want any, except sometimes, when she was in a tight corner, and when ten shillings would have saved her much worry. She still dreamed of William and of what he would do, with herself behind him, never for a minute would she admit to herself how heavy and anxious her heart was because of him. Also he talked a good deal now of a girl he had met at a dance, a handsome brunette, quite young, and a lady, after whom the men were running thick and fast. "'I wonder if you would run, my boy,' his mother wrote to him, "'unless you saw all the other men chasing her, too.' You feel safe enough and vain enough in a crowd. But take care, and see how you feel when you find yourself alone and in triumph." William resented these things, and continued the chase. He had taken the girl on the river. "'If you saw her mother, you would know how I feel. Tall and elegant, with the clearest of clear, transparent olive complexions, hair as black as jet, and such grey eyes bright, mocking, like lights on water at night. It is all very well to be a bit satirical till you see her. And she dresses as well as any woman in London. I tell you, your son doesn't half put his head up when she goes walking down Piccadilly with him." Mrs. Morel wondered, in her heart, if her son did not go walking down Piccadilly with an elegant figure in fine clothes, rather than with a woman who was near to him but she congratulated him in her doubtful fashion. And, as she stood over the washing-tub, the mother brooded over her son. She saw him saddled with an elegant and expensive wife, earning little money, dragging along and getting draggled in some small, ugly house in a suburb. But there, she told herself, I am very likely a silly, meeting trouble half-way. Nevertheless, the load of anxiety scarcely ever left her heart, lest William should do the wrong thing by himself. Presently Paul was bidden call upon Thomas Jordan, manufacturer of surgical appliances, at twenty-one, Spaniel Row, Nottingham. Mrs. Morel was all joy. 
"'There, you see!' she cried, her eyes shining. "'You've only written four letters, and the third is answered. You're lucky, my boy, as I've always said you were.' Paul looked at the picture of a wooden leg, adorned with elastic stockings and other appliances, that figured on Mr. Jordan's note-paper, and he felt alarmed. He had not known that elastic stockings existed, and he seemed to feel the business world, with its regulated system of values, and its impersonality, and he dreaded it. It seemed monstrous also that a business could be run on wooden legs. Mother and son set off together one Tuesday morning. It was August and blazing hot. Paul walked with something screwed up tight inside him. He would have suffered much physical pain rather than this unreasonable suffering at being exposed to strangers, to be accepted or rejected. Yet he chattered away with his mother. He would never have confessed to her how he suffered over these things, and she only partly guessed. She was gay, like a sweetheart. She stood in front of the ticket office at Bestwood, and Paul watched her take from her purse the money for the tickets. As he saw her hands in their old black kid gloves, getting the silver out of the worn purse, his heart contracted with pain of love of her. She was quite excited, and quite gay. He suffered, because she would talk aloud in presence of the other travellers. "'Now look at that silly cow,' she said, careering round as if it thought it was a circus. "'It's most likely a botfly.' he said, very low. "'A what?' she asked brightly and unashamed. They thought a while. He was sensible all the time of having her opposite him. Suddenly their eyes met, and she smiled to him, a rare, intimate smile, beautiful with brightness and love. Then each looked out of the window. The sixteen slow miles of railway journey passed. The mother and son walked down Station Street, feeling the excitement of lovers having an adventure together. In Carrington Street they stopped to hang over the parapet and look at the barges on the canal below. "'It's just like Venice,' he said, seeing the sunshine on the water that lay between high factory walls. "'Perhaps,' she answered, smiling. They enjoyed the shops immensely. "'Now you see that blouse,' she would say. "'Wouldn't that just suit our Annie? And for one and eleven three, isn't that cheap?' "'And made of needlework as well,' he said. "'Yes.' They had plenty of time, so they did not hurry. The town was strange and delightful to them. But the boy was tied up inside in a knot of apprehension. He dreaded the interview with Thomas Jordan. It was nearly eleven o'clock, by St. Peter's Church. They turned up a narrow street that led to the castle. It was gloomy and old-fashioned, having low dark shops and dark green house-doors with brass knockers, and yellow ochred doorsteps projecting on to the pavement. Then another old shop, whose small window looked like a cunning half-shut eye. Mother and son went cautiously, looking everywhere for Thomas Jordan and Son. It was like hunting in some wild place. They were on tiptoe of excitement. Suddenly they spied a big, dark archway, in which were names of various firms, Thomas Jordan among them. "'Here it is,' said Mrs. Morrill. "'But now where is it?' They looked round. On one side was a queer, dark cardboard factory, on the other a commercial hotel. "'It's up the entry,' said Paul." and they ventured under the archway as into the jaws of the dragon. They emerged into a wide yard, like a well, with buildings all round. It was littered with straw and boxes and cardboard. The sunshine actually caught one crate, whose straw was streaming on to the yard like gold. But elsewhere the place was like a pit. There were several doors and two flights of steps. Straight in front, on a dirty glass door at the top of a staircase, loomed the ominous words, Thomas, Jordan, and Son, Surgical Appliances. Mrs. Morrill went first. Her son followed her. 
Charles I mounted his scaffold with a lighter heart than had Paul Morrill as he followed his mother up the dirty steps to the dirty door. She pushed open the door, and stood in pleased surprise. In front of her was a big warehouse, with creamy paper parcels everywhere, and clerks, with their shirt-sleeves rolled back, were going about in an at-home sort of way. The light was subdued, the glossy cream parcels seemed luminous, the counters were of dark brown wood. All was quiet and very homely. Mrs. Morrill took two steps forward, then waited. Paul stood behind her. She had on her Sunday bonnet and a black veil. He wore a boy's broad white collar and a Norfolk suit. One of the clerks looked up. He was thin and tall, with a small face. His way of looking was alert. Then he glanced round to the other end of the room, where there was a glass office. And then he came forward. He did not say anything, but leaned in a gentle, inquiring fashion towards Mrs. Morrill. "'Can I see Mr. Jordan?' she asked. "'I'll fetch him,' answered the young man. He went down to the glass office. A red-faced, white-whiskered old man looked up. He reminded Paul of a Pomeranian dog. Then the same little man came up the room. He had short legs, was rather stout, and wore an alpaca jacket. So with one ear up, as it were, he came stoutly and inquiringly down the room. "'Good morning,' he said, hesitating before Mrs. Morrill, in doubt as to whether she were a customer or not. "'Good morning. I came with my son, Paul Morrill. You asked him to call this morning.' "'Come this way,' said Mr. Jordan, in a rather snappy little manner, intended to be businesslike. They followed the manufacturer into a grubby little room, upholstered in black American leather, glossy with the rubbing of many customers. On the table was a pile of trusses, yellow wash-leather hoops tangled together. They looked new and living. Paul sniffed the odour of new wash-leather. He wondered what the things were. By this time he was so much stunned that he only noticed the outside things. "'Sit down,' said Mr. Jordan, irritably pointing Mrs. Morrill to a horsehair chair. She sat on the edge in an uncertain fashion. Then the little old man fidgeted and found a paper. "'Did you write this letter?' he snapped, thrusting what Paul recognized as his own notepaper in front of him. "'Yes,' he answered. At that moment he was occupied in two ways. First, in feeling guilty for telling a lie, since William had composed the letter. Second, in wondering why his letter seemed so strange and different, in the fat red hand of the man, from what it had been when it lay on the kitchen table. It was like a part of himself, gone astray. He resented the way the man held it. "'Where did you learn to write?' said the old man crossly. Paul merely looked at him shamedly, and did not answer. "'He is a bad writer,' put in Mrs. Morrill, apologetically. Then she pushed up her veil. Paul hated her for not being prouder with this common little man, and he loved her face clear of the veil. "'And you say you know French?' inquired the little man, still sharply. "'Yes,' said Paul. "'What school did you go to?' "'The board school.' "'And did you learn it there?' Uh, "'No, I—' The boy went crimson and got no farther. "'His godfather gave him lessons,' said Mrs. Morrill, half pleading and rather distant. Mr. Jordan hesitated. Then, in his irritable manner, he always seemed to keep his hands ready for action, he pulled another sheet of paper from his pocket, unfolded it. The paper made a crackling noise. He handed it to Paul. "'Read that,' he said. It was a note in French, in thin, flimsy, foreign handwriting, that the boy could not decipher. He stared blankly at the paper. "'Monsieur,' he began, then he looked in great confusion at Mr. Jordan. "'It's the—it's the—' He wanted to say handwriting, but his wits would no longer work even sufficiently to supply him with the word. Feeling an utter fool, and hating Mr. Jordan, 
he turned desperately to the paper again. "'Sir, please send me—' uh, I, I, "'I can't tell the, uh, two pairs—' Grifuba, grey thread stockings, uh, uh, sans, without, uh, I can't tell the words, uh, dwat, fingers, uh, I can't tell the. He wanted to say handwriting, but the words still refused to come. Seeing him stuck, Mr. Jordan snatched the paper from him. Please send by return two pairs grey thread stockings without toes. Well, flashed Paul, Dwat means fingers as well as, as a rule. The little man looked at him. He did not know whether Dwat meant finger. He knew that for all his purposes it meant toes. Fingers to stockings, he snapped. Well, it does mean fingers, the boy persisted. He hated the little man, who made such a clod of him. Mr. Jordan looked at the pale, stupid, defiant boy, then at the mother, who sat quiet and with all that peculiar shut-off look of the poor who have to depend on the favour of others. "'And when could he come?' he asked. "'Well,' said Mrs. Morrell, "'as soon as you wish. He has finished school now.' "'He would live in Bestwood?' "'Yes, but he could be in, at the station, at quarter to eight. Huh. It ended by Paul's being engaged as junior spiral clerk at eight shillings a week. The boy did not open his mouth to say another word, after having insisted that Dwight meant fingers. He followed his mother down the stairs. She looked at him with her bright blue eyes full of love and joy. "'I think you'll like it,' she said. Dwight does mean fingers, mother, and it was the writing. I couldn't read the writing. Never mind, my boy. I'm sure he'll be all right, and you won't see much of him. Wasn't that first young fellow nice? I'm sure you'll like them. But wasn't Mr. Jordan common, mother? Does he own it all? I suppose he was a workman who has got on, she said. You mustn't mind people so much. They're not being disagreeable to you. It's their way. You always think people are meaning things for you, but they don't." It was very sunny. Over the big desolate space of the market-place the blue sky shimmered, and the granite cobbles of the paving glistened. Shops down the long row were deep in obscurity, and the shadow was full of colour. Just where the horse-trams trundled across the market was a row of fruit-stalls, with fruit blazing in the sun, apples and piles of reddish oranges, small green-gauge plums and bananas. There was a warm scent of fruit as mother and son passed. Gradually his feeling of ignominy and of rage sank. "'Where shall we go for dinner?' asked the mother. It was felt to be a reckless extravagance. Paul had only been in an eating-house once or twice in his life, and then only to have a cup of tea and a bun. Most of the people of Bestwood considered that tea and bread and butter, and perhaps potted beef, was all they could afford to eat in Nottingham. Real cooked dinner was considered great extravagance. Paul felt rather guilty. They found a place that looked quite cheap, but when Mrs. Morrell scanned the bill of fare her heart was heavy. Things were so dear. So she ordered kidney-pies and potatoes as the cheapest available dish. "'We oughtn't to have come here, mother,' said Paul. "'Never mind,' she said. "'We won't come again.' She insisted on his having a small currant tart, because he liked sweets. "'I don't want it, mother,' he pleaded. "'Yes,' she insisted. "'You'll have it.' and she looked round for the waitress, but the waitress was busy, and Mrs. Morrell did not like to bother her then. So the mother and son waited for the girl's pleasure, whilst she flirted among the men. "'Brazen hussy,' said Mrs. Morrell to Paul. "'Look now, she's taking that man his pudding, and he came long after us.' "'It doesn't matter, mother,' said Paul. 
Mrs. Morrell was angry. But she was too poor, and her orders were too meagre, so that she had not the courage to insist on her rights just then. They waited and waited. "'Should we go, mother?' he said. Then Mrs. Morrell stood up. The girl was passing near. "'Will you bring one currant tart?' said Mrs. Morrell clearly. The girl looked round insolently. "'Directly,' she said. "'We have waited quite long enough,' said Mrs. Morrell. In a moment the girl came back with the tart. Mrs. Morrell asked coldly for the bill. Paul wanted to sink through the floor. He marvelled at his mother's hardness. He knew that only years of battling had taught her to insist even so little on her rights. She shrank as much as he. "'It's the last time I go there for anything,' she declared, when they were outside the place, thankful to be clear. "'We'll go,' she said, "'and look at keeps and boots, and one or two places, shall we?' They had discussions over the pictures, and Mrs. Morrell wanted to buy him a little sable brush that he hankered after. But this indulgence he refused. He stood in front of milliner's shops and a draper's shops, almost bored, but content for her to be interested. They wandered on. "'Now just look at those black grapes,' she said. "'They make your mouth water. I've wanted some of those for years, but I shall have to wait a bit before I get them.' Then she rejoiced in the florists, standing in the doorway, sniffing. "'Oh, oh, isn't it simply lovely!' Paul saw, in the darkness of the shop, an elegant young lady in black peering over the counter curiously. "'They're looking at you,' he said, trying to draw his mother away. "'But what is it?' she exclaimed, refusing to be moved. "'Stocks,' he answered sniffing hastily. Look, there's a tub full. So there is, red and white. But really, I never knew stocks to smell like it. And, to his great relief, she moved out of the doorway, but only to stand in front of the window. Paul! she cried to him, who was trying to get out of sight of the elegant young lady in black, the shop-girl. Paul, just look here! He came reluctantly back. "'Now just look at that fuchsia!' she exclaimed, pointing. Hm. He made a curious, interested sound. "'You'd think every second as the flowers were going to fall off, they hang so big and heavy.' "'And such an abundance!' she cried. "'And the way they drop downwards with their threads and knots!' "'Yes!' she exclaimed. "'Lovely!' "'I wonder who'll buy it,' he said. "'I wonder,' she answered. "'Not us.' "'It would die in our parlour.' "'Yes, beastly cold, sunless hole. It kills every bit of a plant you put in, and the kitchen chokes them to death.' They bought a few things, and set off towards the station. Looking up the canal, through the dark pass of the buildings, they saw the castle on its bluff of brown, green-bushed rock, in a positive miracle of delicate sunshine. "'Won't it be nice for me to come out at dinner-times?' said Paul. "'I can go all round here and see everything. I shall love it.' "'You will,' assented his mother. He had spent a perfect afternoon with his mother. They arrived home in the mellow evening, happy and glowing and tired. End of Part 1 of chapter 5 sons and lovers by d h lawrence chapter 5 part 2 in the morning he filled in the form for his season ticket and took it to the station when he got back his mother was just beginning to wash the floor he sat crouched up on the sofa he says it'll be here on saturday he said "'And how much will it be?' "'About one pound eleven, he said. She went on washing her floor in silence. "'Is it a lot?' he asked. "'It's no more than I thought,' she answered. "'And I shall earn eight shillings a week,' he said. She did not answer, but went on with her work, 
At last she said, "'That William promised me, when he went to London, as he'd give me a pound a month. He has given me ten shillings, twice, and now I know he hasn't a farthing if I asked him. Not that I want it. Only just now you'd think he might be able to help with this ticket, which I'd never expected.' "'He earns a lot,' said Paul. "'He earns a hundred and thirty pounds. But they're all alike. They're large in promises, but it's precious little fulfilment you get.' "'He spends over fifty shillings a week on himself,' said Paul. "'And I keep this house on less than thirty, she replied, "'and am supposed to find money for extras. But they don't care about helping you, once they've gone.' He'd rather spend it on that dressed-up creature. "'She should have her own money if she's so grand,' said Paul. "'She should, but she hasn't. I asked him. And I know he doesn't buy her a gold bangle for nothing. I wonder who ever bought me a gold bangle.' William was succeeding with his gypsy, as he called her. He asked the girl. Her name was Louisa Lily Dennis Western for a photograph to send to his mother. The photo came, a handsome brunette, taken in profile, smirking slightly, and, it might be, quite naked, for on the photograph not a scrap of clothing was to be seen, only a naked bust. "'Yes,' wrote Mrs. Morrell to her son, "'the photograph of Louis is very striking, and I can see she must be attractive.' But do you think, my boy, it was very good taste of a girl to give her young man that photo to send to his mother? The first? Certainly the shoulders are beautiful, as you say, but I hardly expected to see so much of them at the first view." Morel found the photograph standing on the chiffonier in the parlour. He came out with it between his thick thumb and forefinger. "'Who dost reckon this is?' he asked of his wife. "'It's the girl our William is going with,' replied Mrs. Morrell. "'Hm! There's a bright spark from the look on her, as one as want to do him over much good neither. Who is she?' "'Her name is Louisa Lily Dennis Western.' "'And come again to morrow!' exclaimed the miner. "'And is her an actress?' "'She is not. She's supposed to be a lady.' "'I'll bet!' he exclaimed, still staring at the photo. "'A lady, is she? And how much does she reckon to keep up this sort of game on?' "'On nothing. She lives with an old aunt, whom she hates, and takes what bit of money's given her.' "'Hm!' said Morel, laying down the photograph. "'Then he's a fool to have taken up with such a one as that.' "'Dear Mater,' William replied, I'm sorry you didn't like the photograph. It never occurred to me when I sent it that you mightn't think it decent. However, I told Jip that it didn't quite suit your prim and proper notions, so she's going to send you another that I hope will please you better. She's always being photographed. In fact, the photographers asked her if they may take her for nothing. Presently the new photograph came, with a little silly note from the girl. This time the young lady was seen in a black satin evening bodice, cut square, with little puffed sleeves, and black lace hanging down her beautiful arms. "'I wonder if she ever wears anything except evening clothes,' said Mrs. Morrell, sarcastically. "'I'm sure I ought to be impressed.' "'You are disagreeable, mother,' said Paul. "'I think the first one with bare shoulders is lovely.' "'Do you?' answered his mother. Well, I don't. On the Monday morning the boy got up at six to start work. He had the season ticket, which had cost such bitterness, in his waistcoat pocket. He loved it with its bars of yellow across. His mother packed his dinner in a small shut-up basket, and he set off at a quarter to seven to catch the seven-fifteen train. Mrs. Morrell came to the entry end to see him off. It was a perfect morning. From the ash-tree the slender green fruits that the children call pigeons were twinkling gaily down on a little breeze, into the front gardens of the houses. 
the valley was full of a lustrous dark haze, through which the ripe corn shimmered, and in which the steam from Minton Pit melted swiftly. Puffs of wind came. Paul looked over the high woods of Aldersley, where the country gleamed, and home had never pulled at him so powerfully. "'Good morning, mother,' he said, smiling, but feeling very unhappy. "'Good morning,' she replied cheerfully and tenderly. She stood in her white apron on the open road, watching him as he crossed the field. He had a small, compact body that looked full of life. She felt, as she saw him trudging over the field, that where he determined to go he would get. She thought of William. He would have leaped the fence instead of going round the stile. He was away in London, doing well. Paul would be working in Nottingham. Now she had two sons in the world. She could think of two places, great centres of industry, and feel that she had put a man into each of them, that these men would work out what she wanted. They were derived from her, they were of her, and their works also would be hers. All the morning long she thought of Paul. At eight o'clock he climbed the dismal stairs of Jordan's Surgical Appliance Factory, and stood helplessly against the first great parcel rack, waiting for somebody to pick him up. The place was still not awake. Over the counters were great dust sheets. Two men only had arrived, and were heard talking in a corner, as they took off their coats and rolled up their shirt-sleeves. It was ten past eight. Evidently there was no rush of punctuality. Paul listened to the voices of the two clerks. Then he heard someone cough, and saw in the office at the end of the room an old, decaying clerk, in a round smoking-cap of black velvet embroidered with red and green, opening letters. He waited and waited. One of the junior clerks went to the old man, greeted him cheerily and loudly. Evidently the old chief was deaf. Then the young fellow came striding importantly down to his counter. He spied Paul. "'Hello,' he said. "'You the new lad?' "'Yes,' said Paul. "'Huh! What's your name?' Paul Morrill? Paul Morrill. All right. You come on round here. Paul followed him round the rectangle of counters. The room was second story. It had a great hole in the middle of the floor, fenced as with a wall of counters, and down this wide shaft the lifts went, and the light for the bottom story. Also there was a corresponding big oblong hole in the ceiling, and one could see above, over the fence of the top floor, some machinery, and right away overhead was the glass roof, and all light for the three stories came downwards, getting dimmer, so that it was always night on the ground floor, and rather gloomy on the second floor. The factory was the top floor, the warehouse the second, the storehouse the ground floor. It was an insanitary, ancient place. Paul was led round to a very dark corner. "'This is a spiral corner.' said the clerk. "'Your spiral with Papleworth. He's your boss, but he's not come yet. He doesn't get here till half-past eight. So you can fetch the letters, if you like, from Mr. Melling down there.' The young man pointed to the old clerk in the office. "'All right,' said Paul. "'Here's a peg to hang your cap on. Here are the entry ledgers. Mr. Papleworth won't be long.' and the thin young man stalked away with long, busy strides over the hollow wooden floor. After a minute or two, Paul went down and stood in the door of the glass office. The old clerk in the smoking-cap looked down over the rim of his spectacles. A "'Good morning,' he said, kindly and impressively. "'You want the letters for the spiral department, Thomas?' Paul resented being called Thomas, but he took the letters and returned to his dark place, where the counter made an angle, where the great parcel-rack came to an end, and where there were three doors in the corner. He sat on a high stool and read the letters, those whose handwriting was not too difficult. They ran as follows. "'Will you please send me at once a pair of ladies' silk spiral thigh hose without feet, such as I had from you last year, length, thigh to knee, etc., or Major Chamberlain wishes to repeat his previous order for a silk non-elastic suspensory bandage. 
many of these letters, some of them in French or Norwegian, were a great puzzle to the boy. He sat on his stool, nervously awaiting the arrival of his boss. He suffered tortures of shyness when, at half-past eight, the factory girls for upstairs trooped past him. Mr. Pappleworth arrived, chewing a chlorodyne gum, at about twenty to nine, when all the other men were at work. He was a thin, sallow man with a red nose, quick, staccato, and smartly but stiffly dressed. He was about thirty-six years old. There was something rather doggy, rather smart, rather cute and shrewd, and something warm, and something slightly contemptible about him. "'You, my new lad?' he said. Paul stood up and said he was. "'Fetch the letters.' Mr. Pappleworth gave a chew to his gum. "'Yes.' "'Copied em. "'No.' "'Well, come on, then. Let's look, Slippy. Changed your coat?' "'No.' "'You want to bring an old coat and leave it here.' He pronounced the last words with a chlorodyne gum between his side teeth. He vanished into the darkness behind the great parcel rack, reappeared coatless, turning up a smart striped shirt-cuff over a thin and hairy arm. Then he slipped into his coat. Paul noticed how thin he was, and that his trousers were in folds behind. He seized a stool, dragged it beside the boys, and sat down. "'Sit down,' he said. Paul took a seat. Mr. Pappleworth was very close to him. The man seized the letters, snatched a long entry-book out of a rack in front of him, flung it open, seized a pen, and said, "'Now look here. You want to copy these letters in here?' He sniffed twice, gave a quick chew at his gum, stared fixedly at a letter, then went very still and absorbed, and wrote the entry rapidly, in a beautiful flourishing hand. He glanced quickly at Paul. "'See that?' "'Yes.' "'Dink you can do it all right?' "'Yes.' "'All right, then. Let's see you.' He sprang off his stool. Paul took a pen. Mr. Pappleworth disappeared. Paul rather liked copying the letters, but he wrote slowly, laboriously, and exceedingly badly. He was doing the fourth letter, and feeling quite busy and happy, when Mr. Pappleworth reappeared. "'Now, then, how are you getting on?' Dunham? He leaned over the boy's shoulder, chewing, and smelling of chlorodyne. "'Strike my bob, lad, but you're a beautiful writer!' he exclaimed satirically. "'Never mind. How many have you done?' "'Only three. I'd have eaten them. Get on, my lad, and put numbers on them. Here, look. Get on.' Paul ground away at the letters, whilst Mr. Pappleworth fussed over various jobs. Suddenly the boy started as a shrill whistle sounded near his ear. Mr. Pappleworth came, took a plug out of a pipe, and said, in an amazingly cross and bossy voice, "'Yes?' Paul heard a faint voice, like a woman's, out of the mouth of the tube. He gazed in wonder, never having seen a speaking-tube before. "'Well,' said Mr. Pappleworth, disagreeably into the tube, "'you'd better get some of your back work done, then.' Again the woman's tiny voice was heard, sounding pretty and cross. "'I've not time to stand here while you talk,' said Mr. Pappleworth, and he pushed the plug into the tube. "'Come, my lad,' he said imploringly to Paul. "'There's Polly crying out for them orders. Can't you buck up a bit? Come. Here, come out.' He took the book, to Paul's immense chagrin, and began the copying himself. He worked quickly and well. This done, he seized some strips of long yellow paper, about three inches wide, and made out the day's orders for the work girls. "'You'd better watch me,' he said to Paul, working all the while, rapidly. Paul watched the weird little drawings of legs and thighs and ankles, with the strokes across and the numbers, and the few brief directions which his chief made upon the yellow paper. Then Mr. Pappleworth finished and jumped up. "'Come on with me,' he said, and the yellow papers flying in his hands, he dashed through a door and down some stairs into the basement where the gas was burning. They crossed the cold, damp storeroom, then a long, dreary room with a long table on trestles, into a smaller, cosy apartment, 
not very high, which had been built on to the main building. In this room a small woman with a red serge blouse, and her black hair done on top of her head, was waiting like a proud little bantam. "'Here you are,' said Pappleworth. "'I think it is here you are,' exclaimed Polly. "'The girls have been here nearly half an hour waiting. Just think of the time wasted.' "'You think of getting your work done and not talking so much,' said Mr. Pappleworth. "'You could have been finishing off.' "'You know quite well we finished everything off on Saturday,' cried Polly, flying at him, her dark eyes flashing. "'Tututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututututut
they were singing together, Two Little Girls in Blue. Hearing the door opened, they all turned round, to see Mr. Pappleworth and Paul looking down on them from the far end of the room. They stopped singing. "'Can't you make a bit less row?' said Mr. Pappleworth. "'Folk'll think we keep cats.' A hunchback woman on a high stool turned her long, rather heavy face towards Mr. Pappleworth, and said, in a contralto voice, "'They're all tomcats, then!' In vain Mr. Pappleworth tried to be impressive for Paul's benefit. He descended the steps into the finishing-off room, and went to the hunchback, Fanny. She had such a short body on her high stool that her head, with its great bands of bright brown hair, seemed over-large, as did her pale, heavy face. She wore a dress of green-black cashmere, and her wrists, coming out of the narrow cuffs, were thin and flat as she put down her work nervously. He showed her something that was wrong with a kneecap. "'Well,' she said, "'you needn't come blaming it on to me. It's not my fault.' Her colour mounted to her cheek. "'I never said it was your fault. Will you do as I tell you?' replied Mr. Pappleworth shortly. "'You don't say it's my fault, but you'd like to make out as it was.' The hunchback woman cried, almost in tears. Then she snatched the kneecap from her boss, saying, "'Yes, I'll do it for you, but you needn't be snappy.' "'Here's your new lad,' said Mr. Pappleworth. Fanny turned, smiling very gently on Paul. "'Oh!' she said. "'Yes, don't make a softy of him between you.' "'It's not us as a make a softy of him,' she said indignantly. "'Come on, then, Paul,' said Mr. Pappleworth. "'Au revoir, Paul,' said one of the girls. There was a titter of laughter. Paul went out, blushing deeply, not having spoken a word. The day was very long. All morning the workpeople were coming to speak to Mr. Pappleworth. Paul was writing, or learning to make up parcels, ready for the midday post. At one o'clock, or rather, at a quarter to one, Mr. Pappleworth disappeared to catch his train. He lived in the suburbs. At one o'clock, Paul, feeling very lost, took his dinner-basket down into the stock-room in the basement, that had the long table on trestles, and ate his meal hurriedly, alone in that cellar of gloom and desolation. Then he went out of doors. The brightness and the freedom of the streets made him feel adventurous and happy but at two o'clock he was back in the corner of the big room. Soon the work-girls went trooping past, making remarks. It was the commoner girls who worked upstairs at the heavy tasks of truss-making and the finishing of artificial limbs. He waited for Mr. Pappleworth, not knowing what to do, sitting scribbling on the yellow order-paper. Mr. Pappleworth came at twenty minutes to three. Then he sat and gossiped with Paul, treating the boy entirely as an equal, even in age. In the afternoon there was never very much to do, unless it were near the weekend, and the accounts had to be made up. At five o'clock all the men went down into the dungeon with the table on trestles, and there they had tea, eating bread and butter on the bare, dirty boards, talking with the same kind of ugly haste and slovenliness with which they ate their meal and yet upstairs the atmosphere among them was always jolly and clear. The cellar and the trestles affected them. After tea, when all the gases were lighted, work went more briskly. There was the big evening post to get off. The hose came up warm and newly pressed from the work-rooms. Paul had made out the invoices. Now he had the packing up and addressing to do. Then he had to weigh his stock of parcels on the scales. Everywhere voices were calling weights. There was the chink of metal, the rapid snapping of string, the hurrying to old Mr. Melling for stamps, and at last the postman came with his sack, laughing and jolly. Then everything slacked off, and Paul took his dinner-basket and ran to the station to catch the 8.20 train. The day in the factory was just twelve hours long. His mother sat waiting for him rather anxiously. He had to walk from Keston, so was not home until about twenty past nine, and he left the house before seven in the morning. Mrs. Morel was rather anxious about his health. 
but she herself had had to put up with so much that she expected her children to take the same odds. They must go through with what came. And Paul stayed at Jordan's, although all the time he was there his health suffered from the darkness and lack of air and the long hours. He came in, pale and tired. His mother looked at him. She saw he was rather pleased, and her anxiety all went. "'Well, and how was it?' she asked. "'Ever so funny, mother,' he replied. "'You don't have to work a bit hard, and they're nice with you.' "'And did you get on all right?' "'Yes. They only say my writing's bad. But Mr. Pappleworth, he's my man, said to Mr. Jordan I should be all right. I'm spiral, mother. You must come and see. It's ever so nice.' Soon he liked Jordan's. Mr. Pappleworth, who had a certain saloon-bar flavour about him, was always natural, and treated him as if he had been a comrade. Sometimes the spiral boss was irritable, and chewed more lozenges than ever. Even then, however, he was not offensive, but one of those people who hurt themselves by their own irritability more than they hurt other people. "'Haven't you done that yet?' he would cry. "'Go on, be a month of Sundays.' Again, and Paul could understand him least then, he was jocular and in high spirits. "'I'm going to bring my little Yorkshire terrier bitch to-morrow,' he said jubilantly to Paul. "'What's a Yorkshire terrier?' "'Don't know what a Yorkshire terrier is! Don't know a Yorkshire—' Mr. Pappleworth was aghast. "'Is it a little silky one, colours of iron and rusty silver?' "'That's it, my lad. Oh, she's a gem. She's had five pounds worth of pups already, and she's worth over seven pounds herself, and she doesn't weigh twenty ounces.' The next day the bitch came. She was a shivering, miserable morsel. Paul did not care for her. She seemed so like a wet rag that would never dry. Then a man called for her, and began to make coarse jokes. But Mr. Pappleworth nodded his head in the direction of the boy— and the talk went on, sotto voce. Mr. Jordan only made one more excursion to watch Paul, and then the only fault he found was seeing the boy lay his pen on the counter. "'Put your pen in your ear, if you're going to be a clerk. Pen in your ear!' And one day he said to the lad, "'Why don't you hold your shoulders straighter? Come down here!' When he took him into the glass office, and fitted him with special braces for keeping the shoulders square." But Paul liked the girls best. The men seemed common and rather dull. He liked them all, but they were uninteresting. Polly, the little brisk overseer downstairs, finding Paul eating in the cellar, asked him if she could cook him anything on her little stove. Next day his mother gave him a dish that could be heated up. He took it into the pleasant, clean room to Polly, and very soon it grew to be an established custom that he should have dinner with her. When he came in at eight in the morning he took his basket to her, and when he came down at one o'clock she had his dinner ready. He was not very tall, and pale, with thick chestnut hair, irregular features, and a wide, full mouth. She was like a small bird. He often called her a robinette. Though naturally rather quiet, he would sit and chatter with her for hours, telling her about his home. The girls all liked to hear him talk. They often gathered in a little circle while he sat on a bench, and held forth to them, laughing. Some of them regarded him as a curious little creature, so serious, yet so bright and jolly, and always so delicate in his way with them. They all liked him, and he adored them. Polly he felt he belonged to. Then Connie, with her mane of red hair, her face of apple-blossom, her murmuring voice, such a lady in her shabby black frock, appealed to his romantic side. "'When you sit winding,' he said, "'it looks as if you were spinning at a spinning-wheel. It looks ever so nice. You remind me of Elaine in The Idols of the King. I'd draw you if I could.' And she glanced at him, blushing shyly. And later on he had a sketch he prized very much— Connie sitting on the stool before the wheel, her flowing mane of red hair on her rusty black frock, 
her red mouth shut and serious, running the scarlet thread off the hank on to the reel. With Louis, handsome and brazen, who always seemed to thrust her hip at him, he usually joked. Emma was rather plain, rather old, and condescending, but to condescend to him made her happy, and he did not mind. "'How do you put needles in?' he asked. "'Go away and don't bother.' "'But I ought to know how to put needles in.' She ground at her machine all the while steadily. "'There are many things you ought to know,' she replied. "'Tell me, then, how to stick needles in the machine.' "'Oh, the boy, what a nuisance he is! Why, this is how you do it!' He watched her attentively. Suddenly a whistle piped. Then Polly appeared and said, in a clear voice, "'Mr. Pappleworth wants to know how much longer you're going to be down here playing with the girls, Paul.' Paul flew upstairs, calling, "'Good-bye!' and Emma drew herself up. "'It wasn't me who wanted to play with the machine.' she said. As a rule, when all the girls came back at two o'clock, he ran upstairs to Fanny, the hunchback, in the finishing-off room. Mr. Pappleworth did not appear till twenty to three, and he often found his boy sitting beside Fanny, talking or drawing or singing with the girls. Often, after a minute's hesitation, Fanny would begin to sing. She had a fine contralto voice. Everybody joined in the chorus, and it went well. Paul was not at all embarrassed, after a while, sitting in the room with the half a dozen work-girls. At the end of the song Fanny would say, "'I know you've been laughing at me.' "'Don't be so soft, Fanny,' cried one of the girls. Once there was mention of Connie's red hair. "'Fanny's is better to my fancy,' said Emma. "'You needn't try to make a fool of me,' said Fanny, flushing deeply. "'No, but she has, Paul. She's got beautiful hair.' "'It's a treat of a colour, said he. "'That coldish colour like earth, and yet shiny. "'It's like bog-water.' "'Goodness me!' exclaimed one girl, laughing. "'How I do but get criticised, said Fanny. "'But you should see it down, Paul,' cried Emma earnestly. "'It's simply beautiful.' "'Put it down for him, Fanny, if he wants something to paint.' Fanny would not, and yet she wanted to. "'Then I'll take it down myself,' said the lad. "'Well, you can, if you like,' said Fanny. And he carefully took the pins out of the knot, and the rush of hair, of uniform dark brown, slid over the humped back. "'What a lovely lot!' he exclaimed. The girls watched." There was silence. The youth shook the hair loose from the coil. "'It's splendid,' he said, smelling its perfume. "'I'll bet it's worth pounds.' <laughs> "'I'll leave it you when I die, Paul,' said Fanny, half-joking. "'You look just like anybody else sitting drying their hair,' said one of the girls to the long-legged hunchback. Poor Fanny was morbidly sensitive, always imagining insults. Polly was curt and businesslike. The two departments were forever at war, and Paul was always finding Fanny in tears. Then he was made the recipient of all her woes, and he had to plead her case with Polly. So the time went along happily enough. The factory had a homely feel. No one was rushed or driven. Paul always enjoyed it when the work got faster, towards post-time, and all the men united in labour. He liked to watch his fellow clerks at work. The man was the work, and the work was the man. One thing, for the time being. It was different with the girls. The real woman never seemed to be there at the task, but as if left out, waiting. From the train going home at night he used to watch the lights of the town, sprinkled thick on the hills, fusing together in a blaze in the valleys. He felt rich in life, and happy. Drawing farther off, there was a patch of lights at Bullwell, like myriad petals shaken to the ground from the shed stars, and beyond was the red glare of the furnaces, playing like hot breath on the clouds. 
He had to walk two and more miles from Keston home, up two long hills, down two short hills. He was often tired, and he counted the lamps climbing the hill above him, how many more to pass. And from the hilltop, on pitch-dark nights, he looked round on the villages five or six miles away, that shone like swarms of glittering living things, almost a heaven against his feet. Marlpool and Heonor scattered the far-off darkness with brilliance. And occasionally the black valley space between was traced, violated by a great train rushing south to London, or north to Scotland. The trains roared by like projectiles level on the darkness, fuming and burning, making the valley clang with their passage. They were gone, and the lights of the towns and villages glittered in silence. And then he went to the corner at home, which faced the other side of the night. The ash-tree seemed a friend now. His mother rose with gladness as he entered. He put his eight shillings proudly on the table. "'It'll help, mother?' he asked wistfully. "'There's precious little left,' she answered, "'after your ticket and dinners and such are taken off.' Then he told her the budget of the day. His life story, like an Arabian night's, was told night after night to his mother. It was almost as if it were her own life. End of chapter Sons and Lovers by D. H. Lawrence Chapter Six, Part One Death in the Family Arthur Morrell was growing up. He was a quick, careless, impulsive boy, a good deal like his father. He hated study, made a great moan if he had to work, and escaped as soon as possible to his sport again. In appearance he remained the flower of the family, being well-made, graceful, and full of life. His dark brown hair and fresh colouring, and his exquisite dark blue eyes shaded with long lashes, together with his generous manner and fiery temper, made him a favourite. But as he grew older his temper became uncertain. He flew into rages over nothing seemed unbearably raw and irritable. His mother, whom he loved, wearied of him sometimes. He thought only of himself. When he wanted amusement, all that stood in his way he hated, even if it were she. When he was in trouble he moaned to her ceaselessly. "'Goodness, boy!' she said, when he groaned about a master who, he said, hated him. "'If you don't like it, alter it, and if you can't alter it, put up with it.' and his father, whom he had loved and who had worshipped him, he came to detest. As he grew older, Morrell fell into a slow ruin. His body, which had been beautiful in movement and in being, shrank, did not seem to ripen with the years, but to get mean and rather despicable. There came over him a look of meanness and of paltriness, and when the mean-looking elderly man bullied or ordered the boy about, Arthur was furious. Moreover, Morel's manners got worse and worse, his habits somewhat disgusting. When the children were growing up and in the crucial stage of adolescence, the father was like some ugly irritant to their souls. His manners in the house were the same as he used among the colliers down pit. "'Dirty nuisance!' Arthur would cry, jumping up and going straight out of the house when his father disgusted him. And Morel persisted the more because his children hated it. He seemed to take a kind of satisfaction in disgusting them, and driving them nearly mad while they were so irritably sensitive at the age of fourteen or fifteen. So that Arthur, who was growing up when his father was degenerate and elderly, hated him worst of all. Then, sometimes, the father would seem to feel the contemptuous hatred of his children. "'There's not a man tries harder for his family!' he would shout. "'He does his best for them!' and then gets treated like a dog. But I'm not going to stand it, I tell you." But for the threat, and the fact that he did not try so hard as he imagined, they would have felt sorry. As it was, the battle now went on nearly all between father and children, he persisting in his dirty and disgusting ways, just to assert his independence. They loathed him. Arthur was so inflamed and irritable at last, 
that when he won a scholarship for the grammar school in Nottingham, his mother decided to let him live in town, with one of her sisters, and only come home at weekends. Annie was still a junior teacher in the board school, earning about four shillings a week. But soon she would have fifteen shillings, since she had passed her examination, and there would be financial peace in the house. Mrs. Morel clung now to Paul. He was quiet, and not brilliant, but still he stuck to his painting, and still he stuck to his mother. Everything he did was for her. She waited for his coming home in the evening, and then she unburdened herself of all she had pondered, or of all that had occurred to her during the day. He sat and listened with his earnestness. The two shared lives. William was engaged now to his brunette, and had bought her an engagement ring that cost eight guineas. The children gasped at such a fabulous price. Eight guineas, said Morel. More fool him. If he'd gen me some on it, it'd look better on him. Givin' you some of it, cried Mrs. Morel. Why give you some of it? She remembered he had bought no engagement ring at all, and she preferred William, who was not mean, if he were foolish. But now the young man talked only of the dances to which he went with his betrothed, and the different resplendent clothes she wore. Or he told his mother with glee how they went to the theatre like great swells. He wanted to bring the girl home. Mrs. Morel said she should come at the Christmas. This time William arrived with a lady, but with no presents. Mrs. Morel had prepared supper. Hearing footsteps, she rose and went to the door. William entered. "'Hello, mother!' he kissed her hastily, then stood aside to present a tall, handsome girl, who was wearing a costume of fine black-and-white check and furs. "'Here's Jip!' Miss Western held out her hand and showed her teeth in a small smile. "'Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Morel?' she exclaimed. "'I'm afraid you will be hungry,' said Mrs. Morel. "'Oh, no, we had dinner in the train.' "'Have you got my gloves, Chubby?' William Morel, big and raw-boned, looked at her quickly. "'How should I?' he said. "'Then I've lost them. Don't be cross with me.' A frown went over his face, but he said nothing. She glanced round the kitchen. It was small and curious to her, with its glittering kissing-bunch, its evergreens behind the pictures, its wooden chairs and little deal table. At that moment— Morel came in. "'Hello, Dad!' "'Hello, my son! That's let on me!' The two shook hands, and William presented the lady. She gave the same smile that showed her teeth. "'How do you do, Mr. Morel?' Morel bowed obsequiously. "'I'm very well, and I hope so are you. You must make yourself very welcome.' "'Oh, thank you,' she replied, rather amused. "'You will like to go upstairs,' said Mrs. Morel. "'If you don't mind, but not if it is any trouble to you.' "'It is no trouble. Annie will take you. Walter, carry up this box.' "'And don't be an hour dressing yourself up,' said William to his betrothed. Annie took a brass candlestick, and, too shy almost to speak, preceded the young lady to the front bedroom, which Mr. and Mrs. Morel had vacated for her. It, too, was small and cold by candlelight. The colliers' wives only lit fires in bedrooms in case of extreme illness. "'Shall I unstrap the box?' asked Annie. "'Oh, thank you very much.' Annie played the part of maid, then went downstairs for hot water. "'I think she's rather tired, mother,' said William. "'It's a beastly journey, and we had such a rush.' "'Is there anything I can give her?' asked Mrs. Morel. "'Oh, no, she'll be all right.' But there was a chill in the atmosphere. After half an hour Miss Western came down, having put on a purplish-coloured dress, very fine for the collier's kitchen. "'I told you you'd no need to change,' said William to her. "'Oh, chubby!' Then she turned with that Swedish smile to Mrs. Morel. "'Don't you think he's always grumbling, Mrs. Morel?' "'Is he?' said Mrs. Morel. "'That's not very nice of him.' "'It isn't, really.' 
you are cold, said the mother. Won't you come near the fire? Morel jumped out of his armchair. Come and sit you here, he cried. Come and sit you here. No, Dad, keep your own chair. Sit on the sofa, Jip, said William. No, no, cried Morel. This cheer's warmest. Come and sit here, Miss Wesson. Uh, thank you so much, said the girl, seating herself in the collier's armchair, the place of honour. She shivered, feeling the warmth of the kitchen penetrate her. "'Fetch me a hanky, Chubby, dear,' she said, putting up her mouth to him, and using the same intimate tone as if they were alone, which made the rest of the family feel as if they ought not to be present. The young lady evidently did not realise them as people. They were creatures to her for the present. William winced. In such a household, in Streatham, Miss Western would have been a lady condescending to her inferiors. These people were to her certainly clownish. In short, the working classes. How was she to adjust herself? "'I'll go,' said Annie. Miss Western took no notice, as if a servant had spoken. But when the girl came downstairs again with a handkerchief, she said, "'Oh, thank you,' in a gracious way. She sat and talked about the dinner on the train, which had been so poor, about London, about dances. She was really very nervous, and chattered from fear. Morel sat all the time, smoking his thick twist tobacco, watching her, and listening to her glib London speech as he puffed. Mrs. Morel, dressed up in her best black silk blouse, answered quietly and rather briefly. The three children sat round in silence and admiration. Miss Western was the princess. Everything of the best was got out for her. The best cups, the best spoons, the best tablecloth, the best coffee-jug. The children thought she must find it quite grand. She felt strange, not able to realise the people, not knowing how to treat them. William joked, and was slightly uncomfortable. At about ten o'clock he said to her, "'Aren't you tired, Jip?' "'Rather, Chubby,' she answered, at once in the intimate tones, and putting her head slightly on one side. "'I'll light her the candle, mother,' he said. "'Very well,' replied the mother. Miss Western stood up, held out her hand to Mrs. Morel. "'Good night, Mrs. Morel,' she said. Paul sat at the boiler, letting the water run from the tap into a stone beer-bottle. Annie swathed the bottle in an old flannel pit singlet, and kissed her mother good night. She was to share the room with the lady, because the house was full. "'You wait a minute,' said Mrs. Morel to Annie. And Annie sat nursing the hot water bottle. Miss Western shook hands all round, to everybody's discomfort, and took her departure, preceded by William. In five minutes he was downstairs again. His heart was rather sore, he did not know why. He talked very little till everybody had gone to bed but himself and his mother. Then he stood with his legs apart, in his old attitude on the hearth-rug, and said hesitatingly, "'Well, mother?' "'Well, my son?' She sat in the rocking-chair, feeling somehow hurt and humiliated for his sake. "'Do you like her?' "'Yes,' came the slow answer. "'She's shy yet, mother. She's not used to it. It's different from her aunt's house, you know.' "'Of course it is, my boy. And she must find it... difficult.' "'She does.' Then he frowned swiftly. "'If only she wouldn't put on her blessed airs!' "'It's only her first awkwardness, my boy. She'll be all right.' "'That's it, mother.' he replied gratefully. But his brow was gloomy. "'You know, she's not like you, mother. She's not serious, and she can't think. She's young, my boy. Yes, and she's had no sort of show. Her mother died when she was a child. Since then she's lived with her aunt, whom she can't bear. And her father was a rake. She's had no love. No. Well, you must make up to her. And so, you have to forgive her a lot of things. What do you have to forgive her, my boy? 
I don't know. When she seems shallow, you have to remember she's never had anybody to bring her deeper side out. And she's fearfully fond of me. Anybody can see that. But you know, mother, she's... she's different from us. Those sort of people, like those she lives amongst, they don't seem to have the same principles. You mustn't judge too hastily, said Mrs. Morrell. But he seemed uneasy within himself. In the morning, however, he was up singing and larking round the house. Hello, he called, sitting on the stairs. Are you getting up? Yes, her voice called faintly. Merry Christmas, he shouted to her. Her laugh, pretty and tinkling, was heard in the bedroom. She did not come down in half an hour. Was she really getting up when she said she was? he asked of Annie. Yes, she was, replied Annie. He waited a while, then went to the stairs again. Happy New Year, he called. Thank you, chubby dear, came the laughing voice far away. Buck up, he implored. It was nearly an hour, and still he was waiting for her. Morel, who always rose before six, looked at the clock. "'Well, it's a winder!' he exclaimed. The family had breakfasted, all but William. He went to the foot of the stairs. "'Shall I have to send you an Easter egg up there?' he called rather crossly. She only laughed. The family expected, after that time of preparation, something like magic. At last she came, looking very nice in a blouse and skirt. "'Have you really been all this time getting ready?' he asked. "'Chubby, dear, that question is not permitted. Is it, Mrs. Morrell? She played the grand lady at first. When she went with William to chapel, he in his frock-coat and silk hat, she in her furs and London-made costume, Paul and Arthur and Annie expected everybody to bow to the ground in admiration, and Morrell, standing in his Sunday suit at the end of the road, watching the gallant pair go, felt he was the father of princes and princesses. And yet she was not so grand. For a year now she had been a sort of secretary or clerk in a London office. But while she was with the Morrells, she queened it. She sat and let Annie or Paul wait on her as if they were her servants. She treated Mrs. Morrell with a certain glibness, and Morrell with patronage. But after a day or so she began to change her tune. William always wanted Paul or Annie to go along with them on their walks. It was so much more interesting. And Paul really did admire Gypsy wholeheartedly. In fact, his mother scarcely forgave the boy for the adulation with which he treated the girl. On the second day, when Lily said, "'Oh, Annie, do you know where I left my muff?' William replied, "'You know it is in your bedroom. Why do you ask Annie?' And Lily went upstairs with a cross, shut mouth. But it angered the young man that she made a servant of his sister. On the third evening, William and Lily were sitting together in the parlour, by the fire, in the dark. At a quarter to eleven, Mrs. Morrell was heard raking the fire. William came out to the kitchen, followed by his beloved. "'Is it as late as that, mother?' he said. She had been sitting alone. "'It is not late, my boy, but it is as late as I usually sit up.' "'Won't you go to bed, then?' he asked. "'And leave you, too? No, my boy, I don't believe in it.' "'Can't you trust us, mother?' "'Whether I can or not, I won't do it. You can stay till eleven if you like, and I can read.' "'Go to bed, Jip,' he said to his girl. "'We won't keep Mater waiting.' "'Annie has left the candle burning, Lily,' said Mrs. Morrell. "'I think you will see.' "'Yes, thank you. Good night, Mrs. Morrell.' William kissed his sweetheart at the foot of the stairs, and she went. He returned to the kitchen. "'Can't you trust us, mother?' he repeated, rather offended. "'My boy, I tell you I don't believe in leaving two young things like you alone downstairs.' when everyone else is in bed. And he was forced to take this answer. He kissed his mother good night. 
At Easter he came over alone. And then he discussed his sweetheart endlessly with his mother. "'You know, mother, when I'm away from her, I don't care for her a bit. I shouldn't care if I never saw her again. But then, when I'm with her in the evenings, I'm awfully fond of her.' "'It's a queer sort of love to marry on,' said Mrs. Morrell, "'if she holds you no more than that.' "'It is funny,' he exclaimed. It worried and perplexed him. "'But yet there's so much between us now I couldn't give her up.' "'You know best,' said Mrs. Morrell. "'But if it is as you say, I wouldn't call it love. At any rate, it doesn't look much like it.' "'Oh, I don't know, mother. She's an orphan, and—' They never came to any sort of conclusion. He seemed puzzled and rather fretted. She was rather reserved. All his strength and money went in keeping this girl. He could scarcely afford to take his mother to Nottingham when he came over. Paul's wages had been raised at Christmas to ten shillings, to his great joy. He was quite happy at Jordan's, but his health suffered from the long hours and the confinement. His mother, to whom he became more and more significant, thought how to help. His half-day holiday was on Monday afternoon. On a Monday morning in May, as the two sat alone at breakfast, she said, "'I think it will be a fine day.' He looked up in surprise. This meant something. "'You know Mr. Livers has gone to live on a new farm. Well, he asked me last week if I wouldn't go and see Mrs. Livers, and I promised to bring you on Monday, if it's fine. Shall we go?' "'I say, little woman, how lovely!' he cried. "'And we'll go this afternoon?' Paul hurried off to the station, jubilant. Down Derby Road was a cherry-tree that glistened. The old brick wall by the statute's ground burned scarlet. Spring was a very flame of green." and the steep swoop of high road lay, in its cool morning dust, splendid with patterns of sunshine and shadow, perfectly still. The trees sloped their great green shoulders proudly, and inside the warehouse all the morning the boy had a vision of spring outside. When he came home at dinner-time his mother was rather excited. "'Are we going?' he asked. "'When I'm ready,' she replied. Presently he got up. "'Go and get dressed while I wash up,' he said. She did so. He washed the pots, straightened, and then took her boots. They were quite clean. Mrs. Morrell was one of those naturally exquisite people who can walk in mud without dirtying their shoes. But Paul had to clean them for her. They were kid boots at eight shillings a pair. He, however, thought them the most dainty boots in the world, and he cleaned them with as much reverence as if they had been flowers. Suddenly she appeared in the inner doorway, rather shyly. She had got a new cotton blouse on. Paul jumped up and went forward. "'Oh, my stars!' he exclaimed. "'What a bobby-dazzler!' She sniffed in a little haughty way, and put her head up. "'It's not a bobby-dazzler at all,' she replied. "'It's very quiet.' She walked forward whilst he hovered round her. "'Well?' she asked, quite shy, but pretending to be high and mighty. "'Do you like it?' "'Awfully! You are a fine little woman to go jaunting out with!' He went and surveyed her from the back. "'Well,' he said, "'if I was walking down the street behind you, I should say, "'Doesn't that little person fancy herself?' "'Well, she doesn't,' replied Mrs. Morrell. "'She's not sure it suits her.' Oh, no, she wants to be in dirty black, looking as if she was wrapped in burnt paper. <laughs> it does suit you, and I say you look nice. She sniffed in her little way, pleased but pretending to know better. Well, she said, it's cost me just three shillings. You couldn't have got it ready-made for that price, could you? I should think you couldn't, he replied. And, you know, it's good stuff. "'Awfully pretty,' he said. The blouse was white, with a little sprig of heliotrope in black. "'Too young for me, though, I'm afraid,' she said. 
"'Too young for you!' he exclaimed in disgust. "'Why don't you buy some false white hair and stick it on your head?' "'I shall soon have no need,' she replied. "'I'm going white fast enough.' "'Well, you've no business to,' he said. "'What do I want with a white-haired mother?' "'I'm afraid you'll have to put up with one, my lad,' she said rather strangely. They set off in great style, she carrying the umbrella William had given her, because of the sun. Paul was considerably taller than she, though he was not big. He fancied himself. On the fallow land the young wheat shone silkily. Minton Pitt waved its plumes of white steam, coughed and rattled hoarsely. "'Now look at that,' said Mrs. Morel. Mother and son stood on the road to watch. Along the ridge of the great pit-hill crawled a little group in silhouette against the sky, a horse, a small truck, and a man. They climbed the incline against the heavens. At the end the man tipped the wagon. There was an undue rattle as the waste fell down the sheer slope of the enormous bank. "'You sit a minute, mother,' he said, and she took a seat on a bank whilst he sketched rapidly. She was silent whilst he worked, looking round at the afternoon, the red cottages shining among their greenness. "'The world is a wonderful place,' she said, "'and wonderfully beautiful.' "'And so's the pit,' he said. "'Look how it heaps together, like something alive almost, a big creature that you don't know.' "'Yes,' she said. "'Perhaps.' "'And all the trucks standing waiting, like a string of beasts to be fed,' he said. "'And very thankful I am they are standing,' she said, "'for that means they'll turn middling time this week. "'But I like the feel of men on things, while they're alive. "'There's a feel of men about trucks, because they've been handled with men's hands, all of them. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Morel. They went along under the trees of the high road. He was constantly informing her, but she was interested. They passed the end of Nethermere, that was tossing its sunshine like petals lightly in its lap. Then they turned on a private road, and in some trepidation approached a big farm. A dog barked furiously. A woman came out to see. "'Is this the way to Willie Farm?' Mrs. Morel asked. Paul hung behind in terror of being sent back. But the woman was amiable and directed them. The mother and son went through the wheat and oats, over a little bridge into a wild meadow. Peewits, with their white breasts glistening, wheeled and screamed about them. The lake was still and blue. High overhead a heron floated. Opposite, the wood heaped on the hill, green and still. "'It's a wild road, mother,' said Paul, "'just like Canada.' "'Isn't it beautiful?' said Mrs. Morel, looking round. "'See that heron? See? See her legs?' He directed his mother what she must see and what not, and she was quite content. "'But now,' she said, "'which way? He told me through the wood.' The wood, fenced and dark, lay on their left. "'I can feel a bit of a path this road,' said Paul. "'You've got town feet, somehow or other. You have.' They found a little gate, and soon were in a broad green alley of the wood, with a new thicket of fir and pine on one hand, an old oak glade dipping down on the other. And among the oaks the bluebell stood in pools of azure, under the new green hazels, upon a pale fawn floor of oak leaves. He found flowers for her. "'Here's a bit of new-mown hay,' he said. Then again he brought her forget-me-nots. And again his heart hurt with love, seeing her hand, used with work, holding the little bunch of flowers he gave her. She was perfectly happy. But at the end of the riding was a fence to climb. Paul was over in a second. "'Come,' he said, "'let me help you.' "'No, go away. I will do it in my own way.' He stood below with his hands up, ready to help her. She climbed cautiously. "'What a way to climb!' 
he exclaimed scornfully, when she was safely to earth again. "'Hateful styles!' she cried. "'Duffer of a little woman!' he replied, "'who can't get over em. In front, along the edge of the wood, was a cluster of low red farm buildings. The two hastened forward. Flush with the wood was the apple orchard, where blossom was falling on the grindstone. The pond was deep under a hedge and overhanging oak trees. Some cows stood in the shade. The farm and buildings, three sides of a quadrangle, embraced the sunshine towards the wood. It was very still. Mother and son went into the small railed garden, where there was a scent of red gillivers. By the open door were some flowery loaves put out to cool. A hen was just coming to peck them. Then, in the doorway, suddenly appeared a girl in a dirty apron. She was about fourteen years old, had a rosy dark face, a bunch of short black curls, very fine and free, and dark eyes, shy, questioning, a little resentful of the strangers. She disappeared. In a minute another figure appeared, a small, frail woman, rosy, with great dark brown eyes. "'Oh!' she exclaimed, smiling with a little glow. "'You've come, then! I am glad to see you!' Her voice was intimate and rather sad. The two women shook hands. "'Now are you sure we're not a bother to you?' said Mrs. Morel. "'I know what a farming life is.' "'Oh, no! We're only too thankful to see a new face. It's so lost up here.' "'I suppose so,' said Mrs. Morel. They were taken through into the parlour, a long low room, with a great bunch of gilder roses in the fireplace. There the women talked, whilst Paul went out to survey the land. He was in the garden smelling the gillivers and looking at the plants, when the girl came out quickly to the heap of coal which stood by the fence. "'I suppose these are cabbage roses?' he said to her, pointing to the bushes along the fence. She looked at him with startled big brown eyes. "'I suppose they are cabbage roses when they come out?' he said. Uh, "'I don't know,' she faltered. "'They're white with pink middles.' "'Then they're made in blush.' Miriam flushed. She had a beautiful warm colouring. "'I don't know,' she said. "'You don't have much in your garden,' he said. "'This is our first year here,' she answered in a distant, rather superior way, drawing back and going indoors. He did not notice, but went his round of exploration. Presently his mother came out, and they went through the buildings. Paul was hugely delighted. "'And I suppose you had the fowls and calves and pigs to look after?' said Mrs. Morel to Mrs. Livers. "'No,' replied the little woman. "'I can't find time to look after cattle.' and I'm not used to it. It's as much as I can do to keep going in the house." "'Well, I suppose it is,' said Mrs. Morel. Presently the girl came out. "'Tea is ready, mother,' she said in a musical, quiet voice. "'Oh, thank you, Miriam. Then we'll come,' replied her mother, almost ingratiatingly. "'Would you care to have tea now, Mrs. Morel?' "'Of course,' said Mrs. Morel whenever is ready." Paul and his mother and Mrs. Slivers had tea together. Then they went out into the wood that was flooded with bluebells, while fumy forget-me-nots were in the paths. The mother and son were in ecstasy together. When they got back to the house, Mr. Livers and Edgar, the eldest son, were in the kitchen. Edgar was about eighteen. Then Geoffrey and Morris, big lads of twelve and thirteen, were in from school. Mr. Livers was a good-looking man in the prime of life, with a golden-brown moustache and blue eyes screwed up against the weather. The boys were condescending, but Paul scarcely observed it. They went round for eggs, scrambling into all sorts of places. As they were feeding the fowls, Miriam came out. The boys took no notice of her. One hen, with her yellow chickens, was in a coop. Morris took his hand full of corn and let the hen peck from it. "'Durst you do it?' he asked of Paul. "'Let's see,' said Paul. 
He had a small hand, warm and rather capable looking. Miriam watched. He held the corn to the hen. The bird eyed it with her hard bright eye, and suddenly made a peck into his hand. He started and laughed. Rap, 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 went the bird's beak in his palm. He laughed again, and the other boys joined. "'She knocks you and nips you, but she never hurts,' said Paul, when the last corn had gone. "'Now, Miriam,' said Morris, "'you come and have a go.' "'No!' she cried, shrinking back. "'Ha! Baby! The Marty kid!' said her brothers. "'It doesn't hurt a bit,' said Paul. "'It only just nips rather nicely.' "'No!' she still cried, shaking her black curls and shrinking. "'She durstn't,' said Geoffrey. "'She never durst do anything except recite poetry. "'Durstn't jump off a gate, durstn't tweedle, durstn't go on a slide, durstn't stop a girl hitting her. "'She can do nought but go about thinking herself somebody. "'The Lady of the Lake. Yah! cried Morris. "'Miriam was crimson with shame and misery. "'I dare do more than you,' she cried. You're never anything but cowards and bullies. Oh, cowards and bullies, they repeated mincingly, mocking her speech. Not such a clown shall anger me. A boor is answered silently. He quoted against her, shouting with laughter. She went indoors. Paul went with the boys into the orchard, where they had rigged up a parallel bar. They did feats of strength. He was more agile than strong, but it served. He fingered a piece of apple-blossom that hung low on a swinging bough. "'I wouldn't get the apple-blossom,' said Edgar, the eldest brother. "'There'll be no apples next year.' "'I wasn't going to get it,' replied Paul, going away. The boys felt hostile to him. They were more interested in their own pursuits. He wandered back to the house to look for his mother. As he went round the back, he saw Miriam kneeling in front of the hen-coop, some maize in her hand, biting her lip, and crouching in an intense attitude. The hen was eyeing her wickedly. Very gingerly she put forward her hand. The hen bobbed for her. She drew back quickly with a cry, half of fear, half of chagrin. "'It won't hurt you,' said Paul. She flushed crimson and started up. I only wanted to try, she said in a low voice. See, it doesn't hurt, he said, and putting only two corns in his palm, he let the hen peck, peck, peck at his bare hand. It only makes you laugh, he said. She put her hand forward and dragged it away, tried again, and started back with a cry. He frowned. Why, I'd let her take corn from my face said Paul. Only she bumps a bit. She's ever so neat. If she wasn't, look how much ground she'd peck up every day. He waited grimly and watched. At last Miriam let the bird peck from her hand. She gave a little cry, fear, and pain because of fear, rather pathetic. But she had done it, and she did it again. There, you see, said the boy. It doesn't hurt, does it?" She looked at him with dilated, dark eyes. No! She laughed, trembling. Then she rose and went indoors. She seemed to be in some way resentful of the boy. He thinks I'm only a common girl, she thought, and she wanted to prove she was a grand person, like the Lady of the Lake. End of Part 1 of Chapter 6 Sons and Lovers by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 6, Part 2 Death in the Family Paul found his mother ready to go home. She smiled on her son. He took the great bunch of flowers. Mr. and Mrs. Livers walked down the fields with them. The hills were golden with evening. Deep in the woods showed the darkening purple of bluebells. It was everywhere perfectly still save for the rustling of leaves and birds. "'But it is a beautiful place,' said Mrs. Morrell. "'Yes,' answered Mr. Livers. 
"'It's a nice little place, if only it weren't for the rabbits. "'The pasture's bitten down to nothing. "'I don't know if I shall ever get the rent off it.' "'He clapped his hands, and the field broke into motion near the woods, "'brown rabbits hopping everywhere. "'Would you believe it?' exclaimed Mrs. Morrell. "'She and Paul went on alone together. "'Wasn't it lovely, mother?' he said quietly. A thin moon was coming out. His heart was full of happiness till it hurt. His mother had to chatter, because she too wanted to cry with happiness. "'Now wouldn't I help that man?' she said. "'Wouldn't I see to the fowls and the young stock? And I'd learn to milk, and I'd talk with him, and I'd plan with him. My word, if I were his wife, the farm would be run, I know. But there—' She hasn't the strength. She simply hasn't the strength. She ought never to have been burdened like it, you know. I'm sorry for her, and I'm sorry for him, too. My word, if I'd had him, I shouldn't have thought him a bad husband. Not that she does either, and she's very lovable. William came home again with his sweetheart at the Whitsuntide. He had one week of his holidays then. It was beautiful weather. As a rule, William and Lily and Paul went out in the morning together for a walk. William did not talk to his beloved much, except to tell her things from his boyhood. Paul talked endlessly to both of them. They lay down, all three, in a meadow by Minton Church. On one side, by the castle farm, was a beautiful quivering screen of poplars. Hawthorne was dropping from the hedges, Penny daisies and ragged robin were in the field, like laughter. William, a big fellow of twenty-three, thinner now and even a bit gaunt, lay back in the sunshine and dreamed, while she fingered with his hair. Paul went gathering the big daisies. She had taken off her hat. Her hair was black as a horse's mane. Paul came back and threaded daisies in her jet-black hair, big spangles of white and yellow, and just a pink touch of ragged robin. "'Now you look like a young witch-woman,' the boy said to her. "'Doesn't she, William?' Lily laughed. William opened his eyes and looked at her. In his gaze was a certain baffled look of misery and fierce appreciation. "'Has he made a sight of me?' she asked, laughing down on her lover. "'That he has,' said William, smiling. He looked at her. Her beauty seemed to hurt him. He glanced at her flower-decked head and frowned. "'You look nice enough, if that's what you want to know,' he said. And she walked without her hat. In a little while William recovered, and was rather tender to her. Coming to a bridge, he carved her initials and his in a heart. L. L. W. W. M. She watched his strong, nervous hand, with its glistening hairs and freckles, as he carved, and she seemed fascinated by it. All the time there was a feeling of sadness and warmth, and a certain tenderness in the house, whilst William and Lily were at home. But often he got irritable. She had brought, for an eight days' stay, five dresses and six blouses. "'Oh, would you mind?' she said to Annie. "'Washing me these two blouses, and these things?' And Annie stood washing, while William and Lily went out the next morning. Mrs. Morrell was furious, and sometimes the young man, catching a glimpse of his sweetheart's attitude towards his sister, hated her. On Sunday morning she looked very beautiful in a dress of foulard, silky and sweeping, and blue as a jaybird's feather and in a large cream hat covered with many roses, mostly crimson. Nobody could admire her enough. But in the evening, when she was going out, she asked again, "'Chubby, have you got my gloves?' "'Which?' asked William. "'My new black suede.' "'No.' There was a hunt. She had lost them. "'Look here, mother,' said William. "'That's the fourth pair she's lost since Christmas.' at five shillings a pair. "'You only gave me two of them,' she remonstrated. And in the evening, after supper, 
He stood on the hearth-rug whilst she sat on the sofa, and he seemed to hate her. In the afternoon he had left her whilst he went to see some old friend. She had sat looking at a book. After supper William wanted to write a letter. "'Here is your book, Lily,' said Mrs. Morel. "'Would you care to go on with it for a few minutes?' "'No, thank you,' said the girl. "'I will sit still.' "'But it is so dull.' William scribbled irritably at a great rate. As he sealed the envelope, he said, "'Read a book! Why, she's never read a book in her life!' "'Oh, go along!' said Mrs. Morel, crossed with the exaggeration. "'It's true, mother, she hasn't!' he cried, jumping up and taking his old position on the hearth-rug. "'She's never read a book in her life!' "'Her's like me!' chimed in Morel. "'Her cannot see what there is in the books. To sit boring your nose in em for, nor more can I.' "'But you shouldn't say these things,' said Mrs. Morel to her son. "'But it's true, mother, she can't read. What did you give her?' "'Well, I gave her a little thing of Annie Swan's. Nobody wants to read dry stuff on Sunday afternoon.' "'Well, I'll bet she didn't read ten lines of it.' "'You are mistaken,' said his mother. All the time Lily sat miserably on the sofa. He turned to her swiftly. "'Did you read any?' he asked. "'Yes, I did,' she replied. "'How much?' I don't know how many pages. Tell me one thing you read. She could not. She never got beyond the second page. He read a great deal, and had a quick, active intelligence. She could understand nothing but love-making and chatter. He was accustomed to having all his thoughts sifted through his mother's mind, so when he wanted companionship, and was asked in reply to be the billing and twittering lover— he hated his betrothed. "'You know, mother,' he said, when he was alone with her at night, "'she's no idea of money. She's so whistle-brained. She'll suddenly buy such rot as Marin Glacé, and then I have to buy her season ticket, and her extras, even her underclothing. And she wants to get married, and I think myself we might as well get married next year. But at this rate—' "'A fine mess of a marriage it would be,' replied his mother. "'I should consider it again, my boy.' "'Oh, well, I've gone too far to break off now,' he said. "'And so I shall get married as soon as I can.' "'Very well, my boy. If you will, you will, and there's no stopping you. But I tell you, I can't sleep when I think about it.' "'Oh, she'll be all right, mother.' We shall manage. "'And she lets you buy her underclothing?' asked the mother. "'Well,' he began apologetically, "'she didn't ask me, but one morning, and it was cold, I found her on the station shivering, not able to keep still. So I asked her if she was well wrapped up. She said, "'I think so.' So I said, "'Have you got warm underthings on?' And she said, No, they were cotton. I asked her why on earth she hadn't got something thicker on in weather like that, and she said because she had nothing. And there she is, a bronchial subject. I had to take her and get some warm things. Well, mother, I shouldn't mind the money if we had any. And, you know, she ought to keep enough to pay for her season ticket. But no, she comes to me about that, and I have to find the money. "'It's a poor lookout,' said Mrs. Morel bitterly. He was pale, and his rugged face, that used to be so perfectly careless and laughing, was stamped with conflict and despair. "'But I can't give her up now. It's gone too far,' he said. "'And besides, for some things, I couldn't do without her.' "'My boy, remember you're taking your life in your hands,' said Mrs. Morel. "'Nothing is as bad as a marriage that's a hopeless failure. "'Mine was bad enough, God knows, and ought to teach you something, "'but it might have been worse by a long chalk.' 
he leaned with his back against the side of the chimney-piece, his hands in his pockets. He was a big, raw-boned man, who looked as if he would go to the world's end if he wanted to. But she saw the despair on his face. "'I couldn't give her up now,' he said. "'Well,' she said, "'remember there are worse things than breaking off an engagement.' "'I can't give her up now,' he said. The clock ticked on. Mother and son remained in silence, a conflict between them, but he would say no more. At last she said, "'Well, go to bed, my son. You'll feel better in the morning, and perhaps you'll know better.' He kissed her and went. She raked the fire. Her heart was heavy now, as it had never been. Before, with her husband, things had seemed to be breaking down in her, but they did not destroy her power to live. Now her soul felt lamed in itself. It was her hope that was struck. And so often William manifested the same hatred towards his betrothed. On the last evening at home he was railing against her. "'Well,' he said, if you don't believe me what she's like, would you believe she has been confirmed three times? <laughs> Nonsense! laughed Mrs. Morel. Nonsense or not, she has. That's what confirmation means for her. A bit of a theatrical show where she can cut a figure. I haven't, Mrs. Morel, cried the girl. I haven't. It is not true. What? he cried, flashing round on her. Once in Bromley, once in Beckenham, and once somewhere else. Nowhere else, she said in tears. Nowhere else. It was. And if it wasn't, why were you confirmed twice? Once I was only fourteen, Mrs. Morel, she pleaded, tears in her eyes. Yes, said Mrs. Morel. I can quite understand it, child. Take no notice of him. You ought to be ashamed, William, saying such things. But it's true. She's religious. She had blue velvet prayer books. And she's not as much religion or anything else in her than that table leg. Gets confirmed three times for show, to show herself off. And that's how she is in everything. Everything! The girl sat on the sofa, crying. She was not strong. "'As for love,' he cried, "'you might as well ask a fly to love you. It'll love settling on you. Now, say no more,' commanded Mrs. Morel. "'If you want to say these things, you must find another place than this. I am ashamed of you, William. Why don't you be more manly, to do nothing but find fault with a girl, and then pretend you're engaged to her?' Mrs. Morel subsided in wrath and indignation. William was silent, and later he repented, kissed and comforted the girl. Yet it was true what he had said. He hated her. When they were going away, Mrs. Morel accompanied them as far as Nottingham. It was a long way to Keston Station. "'You know, mother,' he said to her, "'Gyp's shallow. Nothing goes deep with her.' "'William, I wish you wouldn't say these things,' said Mrs. Morel, very uncomfortable for the girl who walked beside her. "'But it doesn't, mother. She's very much in love with me now, but if I died she'd have forgotten me in three months.' Mrs. Morel was afraid. Her heart beat furiously, hearing the quiet bitterness of her son's last speech. "'How do you know?' she replied. You don't know, and therefore you've no right to say such a thing. "'He's always saying these things,' cried the girl. "'In three months after I was buried you'd have somebody else, and I should be forgotten,' he said. "'And that's your love.' Mrs. Morel saw them into the train in Nottingham. Then she returned home. "'There's one comfort,' she said to Paul. He'll never have any money to marry on, that I am sure of, and so she'll save him that way. So she took cheer. Matters were not yet very desperate. 
She firmly believed William would never marry his gypsy. She waited, and she kept Paul near to her. All summer long William's letters had a feverish tone. He seemed unnatural and intense. Sometimes he was exaggeratedly jolly. Usually he was flat and bitter in his letter. Ah, his mother said, I'm afraid he's ruining himself against that creature who isn't worthy of his love. No, no more than a rag doll. He wanted to come home. The midsummer holiday was gone. It was long while to Christmas. He wrote in wild excitement, saying he could come for Saturday and Sunday at Goose Fair the first week in October. You are not well, my boy, said his mother when she saw him. She was almost in tears at having him to herself again. No, I've not been well, he said. I've seemed to have a dragging cold all the last month, but it's going, I think. It was sunny October weather. He seemed wild with joy, like a schoolboy escaped. Then again he was silent and reserved. He was more gaunt than ever, and there was a haggard look in his eyes. "'You are doing too much,' said his mother to him. He was doing extra work, trying to make some money to marry on, he said. He only talked to his mother once on the Saturday night. Then he was sad and tender about his beloved. "'And yet you know, mother, for all that, if I died she'd be broken-hearted for two months, and then she'd start to forget me. You'd see she'd never come home here to look at my grave.' not even once. "'Why, William,' said his mother, "'you're not going to die, so why talk about it?' "'But whether or not,' he replied, "'and she can't help it. She is like that, and if you choose her, well, you can't grumble,' said his mother. On the Sunday morning, as he was putting his collar on, "'Look,' he said to his mother, holding up his chin, "'What a rash my collar's made under my chin!' Just at the junction of chin and throat was a big red inflammation. "'It ought not to do that,' said his mother. "'Here, put a bit of the soothing ointment on. You should wear different collars.' He went away on Sunday midnight, seeming better and more solid for his two days at home. On Tuesday morning came a telegram from London that he was ill. Mrs. Morrell got off her knees from washing the floor, read the telegram, called a neighbour, went to her landlady and borrowed a sovereign, put on her things and set off. She hurried to Keston, caught an express for London in Nottingham. She had to wait in Nottingham nearly an hour. A small figure in her black bonnet, she was anxiously asking the porters if they knew how to get to Elmer's End. The journey was three hours. She sat in her corner in a kind of stupor, never moving. At King's Cross still no one could tell her how to get to Elmer's End. Carrying her string-bag, that contained her night-dress, a comb and a brush, she went from person to person. At last they sent her underground to Cannon Street. It was six o'clock when she arrived at William's lodging. The blinds were not down. "'How is he?' she asked. "'No better,' said the landlady. She followed the woman upstairs. William lay on the bed with bloodshot eyes, his face rather discoloured. The clothes were tossed about. There was no fire in the room. A glass of milk stood on the stand at his bedside. No one had been with him. "'Why, my son!' said the mother, bravely. He did not answer. He looked at her, but did not see her. Then he began to say, in a dull voice, as if repeating a letter from dictation, Owing to a leakage in the hold of this vessel, the sugar had set, and become converted into rock. It needed hacking. He was quite unconscious. It had been his business to examine some such cargo of sugar in the port of London. "'How long has he been like this?' the mother asked the landlady. "'He got home at six o'clock on Monday morning, and he seemed to sleep all day. 
Then in the night we heard him talking, and this morning he asked for you. So I wired, and we fetched the doctor. Will you have a fire made? Mrs. Morrell tried to soothe her son, to keep him still. The doctor came. It was pneumonia, and, he said, a peculiar erysipelas, which had started under the chin where the collar chafed, and was spreading over the face. He hoped it would not get to the brain. Mrs. Morrell settled down to nurse. She prayed for William, praying that he would recognize her. But the young man's face grew more discoloured. In the night she struggled with him. He raved, and raved, and would not come to consciousness. At two o'clock, in a dreadful paroxysm, he died. Mrs. Morrell sat perfectly still for an hour in the lodging bedroom. Then she roused the household. At six o'clock, with the aid of the charwoman, she laid him out. Then she went round the dreary London village to the registrar and the doctor. At nine o'clock, to the cottage on Scargill Street, came another wire. William died last night. Let father come. Bring money. Annie, Paul, and Arthur were at home. Mr. Morrell was gone to work. The three children said not a word. Annie began to whimper with fear. Paul set off for his father. It was a beautiful day. At Brinsley Pit the white steam melted slowly in the sunshine of a soft blue sky. The wheels of the headstocks twinkled high up. The screen, shuffling its coal into the trucks, made a busy noise. "'I want my father. He's got to go to London.' said the boy to the first man he met on the bank. "'Thou wants Walter Morrell? Go in there and tell Joe Ward.' Paul went into the little top office. "'I want my father. He's got to go to London.' "'Thy father? Is he down? What's his name?' "'Mr. Morrell.' "'What, Walter? Is out to miss?' "'He's got to go to London.' The man went to the telephone and rang up the bottom office. "'Walter Morrow's wanted. Number 42. Hard. Summit's a miss. There's his lad here.' Then he turned round to Paul. "'He'll be up in a few minutes,' he said. Paul wandered out to the pit-top. He watched the chair come up, with its wagon of coal. The great iron cage sank back on its rest. A full carful was hauled off an empty tram run on to the chair, a bell tingled somewhere, the chair heaved, then dropped like a stone. Paul did not realize William was dead. It was impossible, with such a bustle going on. The puller-off swung the small truck on to the turntable, another man ran with it along the bank down the curving lines. "'And William is dead, and my mother's in London, and what will she be doing?' the boy asked himself, as if it were a conundrum. He watched chair after chair come up, and still no father. At last, standing beside a wagon, a man's form. The chair sank on its rests. Morrell stepped off. He was slightly lame from an accident. "'Is it thee, Paul? Is he worse? You've got to go to London.' The two walked off the pit-bank where men were watching curiously. As they came out and went along the railway, with the sunny autumn field on one side and a wall of trucks on the other, Morrell said in a frightened voice, "'He's never gone, child!' "'Yes.' <sighs> "'When were it?' "'Last night. We had a telegram from my mother.' Morrell walked on a few strides, then leaned up against a truck side, his hand over his eyes. He was not crying. Paul stood looking round, waiting. On the weighing machine a truck trundled slowly. Paul saw everything except his father leaning against the truck as if he were tired. Morrell had only once before been to London. He set off, scared and piqued, to help his wife. That was on Tuesday. The children were left alone in the house. Paul went to work, Arthur went to school, 
and Annie had it a friend to be with her. On Saturday night, as Paul was turning the corner, coming home from Keston, he saw his mother and father, who had come to Sethley Bridge Station. They were walking in silence in the dark, tired, straggling apart. The boy waited. Mother, he said in the darkness. Mrs. Morel's small figure seemed not to observe. He spoke again. "'Paul,' she said, uninterestedly. She let him kiss her, but she seemed unaware of him. In the house she was the same, small, white, and mute. She noticed nothing, she said nothing, only, "'The coffin will be here to-night, Walter. You'd better see about some help.' Then, turning to the children, we're bringing him home. Then she relapsed into the same mute, looking into space, her hands folded on her lap. Paul, looking at her, felt he could not breathe. The house was dead silent. "'I went to work, mother,' he said plaintively. "'Did you?' she answered dully. After half an hour, Morel, troubled and bewildered, came in again. "'Where shall we have him when he does come?' he asked his wife. "'In the front room.' "'Then I'd better shift the table?' "'Yes.' "'And have him across the chairs?' "'You know there?' "'Yes. I suppose so.' Morel and Paul went with a candle into the parlour. There was no gas there. The father unscrewed the top of the big mahogany oval table— and cleared the middle of the room, then he arranged six chairs opposite each other, so that the coffin could stand on their beds. "'You never seed such a length as he is,' said the miner, and watching anxiously as he worked. Paul went to the bay window and looked out. The ash-tree stood monstrous and black in front of the wide darkness. It was a faintly luminous night. Paul went back to his mother. At ten o'clock Morel called, "'He's here!' Everyone started. There was a noise of unbarring and unlocking the front door, which opened straight from the night into the room. "'Bring another candle!' called Morel. Annie and Arthur went. Paul followed with his mother. He stood with his arm round her waist in the inner doorway. Down the middle of the cleared room waited six chairs, face to face. In the window, against the lace curtains, Arthur held up one candle, and by the open door, against the night, Annie stood leaning forward, her brass candlestick glittering. There was the noise of wheels. Outside in the darkness of the street below Paul could see horses in a black vehicle, one lamp, and a few pale faces. Then some men, miners, all in their shirt-sleeves, seemed to struggle in the obscurity. Presently two men appeared, bowed beneath a great weight. It was Morel and his neighbour. "'Steady!' called Morel, out of breath. He and his fellow mounted the steep garden step, heaved into the candlelight with their gleaming coffin end. Limbs of other men were seen struggling behind. Morel and Burns, in front, staggered. The great dark weight swayed. "'Steady! Steady!' cried Morel, as if in pain. All the six bearers were up in the small garden, holding the great coffin aloft. There were three more steps to the door. The yellow lamp of the carriage shone alone down the black road. "'Now, then!' said Morel. The coffin swayed. The men began to mount the three steps with their load. Annie's candle flickered and she whimpered as the first men appeared, and the limbs and bowed heads of six men struggled to climb into the room, bearing the coffin that rode like sorrow on their living flesh. "'Oh, my son, my son!' Mrs. Morrell sang softly, and each time the coffin swung to the unequal climbing of the men. "'Oh, my son, my son, my son! Mother!' Paul whimpered, his hand round her waist. She did not hear. "'Oh, my son, my son!' she repeated. 
Paul saw drops of sweat fall from his father's brow. Six men were in the room, six coatless men, with yielding, struggling limbs, filling the room and knocking against the furniture. The coffin veered, and was gently lowered on to the chairs. The sweat fell from Morel's face on its boards. "'My word, he's a weight!' said a man, and the five miners sighed, bowed, and, trembling with the struggle, descended the steps again, closing the door behind them. The family was alone in the parlour with the great polished box. William, when laid out, was six feet four inches long. Like a monument lay the bright brown, ponderous coffin. William thought it would never be got out of the room again. His mother was stroking the polished wood. They buried him on the Monday, in the little cemetery on the hillside that looks over the fields at the big church and the houses. It was sunny, and the white chrysanthemums frilled themselves in the warmth. Mrs. Morrell could not be persuaded, after this, to talk and take out her old bright interest in life. She remained shut off. All the way home in the train she had said to herself, "'If only it could have been me!' When Paul came home at night he found his mother sitting, her day's work done, with hands folded in her lap upon her coarse apron. She always used to have changed her dress and put on a black apron before. Now Annie set his supper, and his mother sat looking blankly in front of her, her mouth shut tight. Then he beat his brains for news to tell her. "'Mother, Miss Jordan was down to-day, and she said my sketch of a colliery at work was beautiful.' But Mrs. Morrell took no notice. Night after night he forced himself to tell her things, although she did not listen. It drove him almost insane to have her thus. At last, "'What's the matter, mother?' he asked. She did not hear. "'What's the matter?' he persisted. "'Mother, what's the matter?' "'You know what's the matter?' she said irritably, turning away. The lad, he was sixteen years old, went to bed drearily. He was cut off and wretched through October, November, and December. His mother tried, but she could not rouse herself. She could only brood on her dead son. He had been let to die so cruelly. At last, on December 23, with his five shillings Christmas box in his pocket, Paul wandered blindly home. His mother looked at him, and her heart stood still. "'What's the matter?' she asked. "'I'm badly, mother,' he replied. "'Mr. Jordan gave me five shillings for a Christmas box.' He handed it to her with trembling hands. She put it on the table. "'You aren't glad,' he reproached her, but he trembled violently. "'Where hurts you?' she said, unbuttoning his overcoat. It was the old question. "'I feel badly, mother.' She undressed him and put him to bed. He had pneumonia dangerously, the doctor said. "'Might he never have had it if I'd kept him at home, not let him go to Nottingham?' was one of the first things she asked. "'He might not have been so bad,' said the doctor. Mrs. Morrell stood condemned on her own ground. "'I should have watched the living, not the dead.' she told herself. Paul was very ill. His mother lay in bed at nights with him. They could not afford a nurse. He grew worse, and the crisis approached. One night he tossed into consciousness in the ghastly, sickly feeling of dissolution, when all the cells in the body seem in intense irritability to be breaking down, and consciousness makes a last flare of struggle like madness. "'I shall die, mother!' he cried, heaving for breath on the pillow. She lifted him up, crying in a small voice, "'Oh, my son, my son!' That brought him to. He realized her. His whole will rose up and arrested him. He put his head on her breast and took ease of her for love. "'For some things,' said his aunt, 
It was a good thing Paul was ill that Christmas. I believe it saved his mother. Paul was in bed for seven weeks. He got up white and fragile. His father had bought him a pot of scarlet and gold tulips. They used to flame in the window in the March sunshine, as he sat on the sofa chattering to his mother. The two knitted together in perfect intimacy. Mrs. Morrill life now rooted itself in Paul. William had been a prophet. Mrs. Morrill had a little present and a letter from Lily at Christmas. Mrs. Morrill's sister had a letter at the New Year. I was at a ball last night. Some delightful people were there, and I enjoyed myself thoroughly," said the letter. I had every dance, did not sit out one. Mrs. Morrill never heard any more of her. Morrill and his wife were gentle with each other for some time after the death of their son. He would go into a kind of daze, staring wide-eyed and blank across the room. Then he got up suddenly and hurried out to the three spots, returning in his normal state. But never in his life would he go for a walk up Shepstone, past the office where his son had worked, and he always avoided the cemetery. End of chapter.